30 years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee. Featuring Tennessee Radio Hall of Famer George Plaster, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame coach Watson Brown, and Young Guns, Billy Derrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. Hello again, everybody. Welcome in on a beautiful Thursday. It's hot, but that's what you expect it to be on July the 6th. Anyway, we're at our new digs at the Ford Ice Center. It was a busy morning out here because the future Preds played sort of a, I guess you would call it an inter-squad scrimmage game. And look what the cat drug in. Hello, Willie. Hey, what's going on? Funny bumping into you out here at Fort Ice. Yes, yes. First time I've seen the show live here. Beautiful place. Yep. Good setup. I like it. And it's much cooler in here than it is outside. Well, that is true. Willie, let's get to the important issue of the day. You had to call a game today with names like Gunner Wolf Fontaine, uh, Gustav's Grigals, and uh, don't ever forget Ryan Ufko. Yes. <laughs> so how hard was learning all those names? Well, a few of them were here last year when we did the game. So I remember a group of them. You you stack year by year draft picks and they come back sometimes for three or four years while they go through their college season or come over from Europe. But there was a new group to come in there. It is always challenging, especially the first five minutes of the broadcast. You're trying to get your bearings, get the numbers, see what they look like out there. So, yeah, you and I were having some fun with some of the names out there. But that's always the case in hockey. And once you get them, uh, and hopefully they make a name for themselves, and it, it becomes easy to remember guys like that. Here's one. McLean for three. Got it. <laughs> yeah, that one was a little easier. Or if it's Matt McLean, line drive, base hit, left center. So um, if you had to guess, is one player that played today going to see one minute with the Nashville Predators next year? Yeah, I think so. La last year, Luke Evangelista played in this game. Yuso Parsonen played in this game. And both of those guys had big impacts last year as young players. And I, I think they have very good futures with the team. We saw a scar off last year. He got in there a little bit for the Predators. There was a player today, Jake Livingstone, who you might remember came right out of college last year. Kind of a unique situation where if you play four years of college, you're a free agent. And sometimes they entice a player by saying, we'll put you right in the lineup. And so he played a handful of games for the Predators last year. So I think there's a chance you would see him next year. So it's possible. Uh, so I, I would say at least one or two guys might get a little bit of time this year. But it's really two, three, four years down the road that you're really looking to see so, some of these guys. To the, more, to the more important issue of the day. The Mets get a come-from-behind victory last night. Two-run homer in the ninth inning at Arizona. And afterwards, a lot of this, this will jumpstart us. This will this. This will. Have they looked at the standings? Got a long way to go. Good Lord. Got a long way to go. It was nice. that I, I mean, they went a whole month, yeah. George, without winning a I series. Know. A whole month. I know. It was one of the Mets have had some bad months, I can tell you, but that was right up there in the top 10 worst months that they've had. I mean, they, they were listing like months from 1963 when they yeah, were an expansion team. Yeah. It was brutal. So I guess enjoy it while it lasts, but they, you're right. It's a, it's going to be an unbelievably steep hill to climb if they're going to get back in the wild card race. Would you like to say hello to Kelly? Well, I, I won't be able to hear Kelly, I don't think, but I can see Well, I him. think it's better that way. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably well, better. He's, you know him. He's going to have a few jabs, so it might yeah. be just as well that I, I don't hear the jabs. Out. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you can y'all hear me? Yes. Why are the birds chirping in the background? 
I, I have no idea what's going on. My camera just went off. The technical difficulties that are happening today, I, I, can't, I don't know if I can work through this, George. I, I, I really don't. Yeah. I, I mean, this is this is getting way too much for me. And then Willie, I, I've never seen Willie with a ball of head like that. I mean, he just finally said, forget the receding hairline and just went with it, huh? Willie, when did you go bald? That's what Kelly would like to know. Uh, you know, it's been a gradual process, but I went to the the full level. I I think I was inspired by Chris Mason. <laughs> it was I think it's going to join you later today yes. to talk about some of these guys. So yes. I'm steadily going lower, lower. I can't go any further. I, I've gone full full tilt now. Your time, by the way, is up. I'd love to tell people that you miss working with me, but it really doesn't appear <laughs> that you do. <laughs> well, it is good to see you. And, Same uh, here. Yeah, and so have fun on the show today. Chris Mason will join you later. There, there were some yes. guys. If you if you want to take one thing out of today's future stars game, is that the two guys that they drafted in the first round last week? They're both very young. They won't play in the NHL this coming year, but they both were very very good today. Maybe the two best players out there. So that's a very good sign for the future. Matthew Wood and Tanner Mullendyke. Yep, those I are the got two. both names right. Well done. Yeah, good job. How about that. Thank you, Willie. All right. Good seeing you. Okay. Thanks, Go guys. Go Braves. <laughs> Kelly, are the birds chirping? Are you hearing little voices in your head? Birds chirping. I'm in a secluded area in my house that I'm in every day, and there's no bird chirping. Is this? I guess it's just my phone. I guess it's just my phone echoing. I can't tell you, George. Is this Billy's fault? Absolutely, it's Billy's fault. I, I don't understand. Like, I have a. You know, he, he got on here all mad at me, like, what have you done? Did you touch something? I haven't touched this thing since I cut it off yesterday, and I started it back up today. I've done nothing different. Do you have little gremlins in your home? I have no idea, George. I really don't know what's going on. I am, uh, I don't, I, I'm just, like, the work environment that I'm with right now, I don't know if I can handle it, though. I really I don't. understand. You're, you're very sensitive. I'm fragile. Uh, Billy, I know you've got an update. Yeah. Make it quick. <laughs> All right. I have to rumble through this. Rumble. Braves won another series last night. Uh, they Not beat the yes, Guardians. But hell yes. Eight to one. 19 hits and four home runs. But Soroka struggled. He struggled big time. I'm worried about that. Brian Snicker finally had enough in the fifth inning. The command just was not anywhere close to being there. He kept getting out of jams, but he had two hit batters. Walked a bunch of guys. This is not the Mike Soroka that we remember. I'm rooting for him, but last night didn't help him all that much. No. So we'll see what happens with uh, Mr. Soroka. Meanwhile, George, Tennessee baseball has picked up a big transfer. Clemson transfer Billy Amick has committed to Tennessee this morning. He picked Tennessee over Florida, South Carolina, and Texas A&M. He's the fifth transfer to commit to Tennessee this offseason. Tony Vitello is using that LSU model, trying to you know, they're they're I mean, it's a transfer portal age sure. in college sports and baseball is one of the sports. So big pickup for Tennessee this morning. While these are the rules, do do in Rome as the Romans do. Right. I mean, and Kelly's talked about it with recruiting, the way recruiting in college football has changed. And I'm sure you've seen it, you know, with your son firsthand, Kelly. It's the same in baseball. It's it's kind of crazy nowadays. It's a dog-eat-dog dog world out there right now in, in college recruiting. And now you have to recruit the kids that are on your team, which is unbelievable. you got to keep them there. you got to keep them happy. And it's a different world. And we'll get into a little college basketball, maybe recruiting with Ryan Hammer. Uh, coming up. We will hear yeah, him on. Maybe a little college basketball transfer portal action. Speaking of hockey, we're talking about all, all kinds of hockey today. Prospects camp for the Preds. Patrick Hornquist, former Pred, has retired. Two-time Stanley Cup winner has announced his retirement after 15 seasons with three different teams, and he actually beat the Predators. He scored the cup-clinching goal in Game 6 against the Preds. He sure did. In 2017, he was the last pick of the 2005 NHL draft Yeah, by, uh, by Nashville. So what good it proves on is that it doesn't necessarily have to be first round, in particular in hockey, maybe more so in hoops, but not so much necessarily in hockey. It's crazy. I mean, last pick of the draft, and he ends up, what, winning a cup, two cups? Yep. Yeah, two cups. So Good for him. Good, good for Horquist. Good Pred. Good good Penguin. Good NHL career. And last but not least here, Corey Dillon. 
Uh, former Bengals running back is is mad about the franchise's Ring of Honor selection process. Uh, he's the all-time leading rusher in Cincinnati. He once famously said he'd flip burgers during a contract dispute with the club. Uh, so he, he's been in the headlines in Cincinnati before, but he took shots at how Cincinnati honors its former players. He said, uh, he basically said, the Bengals are smart. I give it to them. We will put it in the hands of the season ticket holders so they don't have to take that backlash over who the voters are picking. That's BS. That bad word should come straight for the team. Half these season ticket holder people never seen half of us play. Wow. So I'm sure, I, I wonder how much that goes on at other franchises about mm. uh, how that selection process goes. Whatever the owner wants, the owner gets. That's true. Correct. He's, he's got the red pen. He signs the checks. Yes, he does. Kelly, the birds continue to chirp. We're going to take our first break. And when we come back, Ryan Hammer, I'm going to call him a basketball scouting analyst. The truth of it is this guy knows basketball like very few people on the planet. He will join us after the break. So stick around. From the beautiful Ford Ice Center in Bellevue, we are coming back. How am I going to get to work? My car is totaled. Skylar, our team is making a call right now. We'll get you a rental car. Don't worry. That's a relief. Call us 24-7. We're here. We're going to help. Year number two of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night was awesome. And the reason is really simple. I chose Strike and Spare, and they were amazing. They have great food, great bowling, and a staff that is truly ready to go the extra mile to help you. They have five family fun centers in the area to choose from. And for more info, go to strikeandspare.com or call them at 615-824-5685. Now that the weather has gotten considerably warmer, there's not a better place to spend a morning or an afternoon than Riverside Golf Lanes. So you've probably noticed the weather has gotten a lot warmer, and that means a couple of things in Nashville. It means baseball, and it really means golf. And for me, it's a visit to Riverside Golf Links. The course has improved dramatically. There are now 27 holes, including a nine-hole executive course. If you want tee times or more information, dial them up at 615 615- 847-5074. You can't see the sights without the sounds. From the crack of the bat to the roar of the crowd and everything in between, discover what Hit City has to offer. Spend your nights cheering on the Nashville sounds at First Horizon Park with giveaways, fireworks shows, theme weekends, and more. Single game tickets are on sale now. Visit NashvilleSounds.com to claim your seat today. So who said I can't be a golfer? Well, you know what? This is X Golf, located just down the road from the Fort Ice Center in Bellevue. This is fun. It'll improve your golf game, and you need to stop in and check it out. 8138 Sawyer Brown Road, and who knows, I may get to 200 before it's all over. Well, this is not normally a time where we talk a lot of uh, basketball, but tomorrow we'll do the same. Uh, former Belmont star Evan Brads, who is now on the coaching staff of the Utah Jazz, will join us. He is their head coach in the summer league, so very excited for Evan. That's a good step up for him up that coaching ladder. Ryan Hammer, I called him basketball scouting analyst. You can call him whatever you want. The guy knows his hoops. Ryan, how are you? I'm good. How are we doing? Good, good. I want you to explain this Adam Silver tournament that he announced yesterday. And I got to say this, 
I had the same skepticism about the play-in game, and he proved me dead wrong. But I can't figure this one out. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the in-season tournament is a tricky one. It's uh, the play-in tournament, like you said. A lot of people were skepti- skeptical about it, and the same thing now with the pl- with the uh, in-season tournament. And it's going to be in Vegas. The reason why I think there's really only upside to play with this is because it's going to be regular season games. Everything until the, I think the final four and definitely the finals that they do play in Vegas uh, will be counted towards regular season stats, regular season standings. So they're going to be treating it like it's every other game, uh, which take that as you will as an NBA fan, obviously uh, in the regular season. But I think because they're treating it completely towards the regular season, except for an extra game or two where the players are going to be playing for not only a trophy, but extra money and bonuses on their contracts. Uh, I think there's enough to play for in the end and not too much extra to ask of them. So I honestly think uh, I'm not necessarily saying that I love it or I'm all in for it. I'm just saying that uh, I don't see a lot of bad that can come from it is all. Well, I've got you on the NBA. Where do you think James Harden's headed? God, I wish I wish I could tell you. Uh, if I had to make a good call, I'd say the Clippers. Interesting. I thought you'd say, uh, I thought you'd go, well, no, you know what? Clippers makes as much sense as any of them. Okay, let me, I'm going to hopscotch all over the place. The coaches on the college level seem really split about expanding the NCAA tournament field. On one hand, we all believe this tournament is so good that nobody can really screw it up. But the thought of going to 96 does seem like a radical change. Give me some thoughts. What do you think is going to happen and what do you think should happen? I think there's there's going to be too, there's a need for too much of a majority to change and add that much, right? That's a substantial of a leap where we went from 64 to adding four teams to a 68 with the with the additional play-ins uh, like not honestly not so long ago, a few years ago. And that worked out well because it wasn't such a dramatic change. I think they're going to need too much to make that big of a change. Like you said, it's a topic of conversation in the college basketball world in the offseason and even in season every single year. Uh, it'll never get to that much. And I don't think it will. At least I think the NCAA sees uh, enough responsibility and also enough, I guess, funding and resources and uh, revenue coming in from the tournament as it is now. Uh, and changing it would have to take such a dramatic overhaul to the entire bracket and exact and the settings of the tournament uh right don't think they're going to get to that and again i don't think that enough people are going to are going to support it anyway i think 68 is a good number i think 64 is a good number too to be fair um but i don't think it's going to be going anywhere so uh, isn't one of the other issues cbs and the masters and that they don't want to give up any of that to work around this yeah, I, networking is always going to – media partnerships in general is always going to be a huge thing. We see that in, honestly, every professional sports league. You talk about the Masters, uh, the NBA is going through a whole thing with Turner and, and stuff like that. And I definitely think it's another it's another roadblock. I already mentioned a few. It's another one that adds to the pile why I don't think they're going to change anything. So you can imagine where I'm going to take this one. When I walked out of Bridgestone Arena in March after – Vandy had beaten Kentucky in the SEC tournament. The stuff I heard on the way out from Blue Mist was not just disgruntled. It wasn't just disappointed. It was downright anger, and it was all aimed at John Calipari. Since then, he's tried to go into the transfer portal and get Kentucky back to the promised land how close is he or how close is he not? And ultimately, where's this all going to play out? Yeah, he, John Calipari has been such a polarizing topic of conversation in the college basketball world for honestly the last year more than ever. But for a long time, of course, um, with the landscape changing towards NIL and transfer portal and him still going very heavily on freshman talent, which can definitely succeed. We've only seen this kind of lands, current landscape for a run for a year or two. Um, I do think this this is not going to be the year where he gets to all glory and back to national title with how much youth they have in their roster, but their class is unbelievable. And I think John Calipari does more for the program and for the guys involved than the fans want to admit, whether that's a Kentucky fan, Big Blue Nation, or whether it's a neutral fan like myself or someone else. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot more layers to it that Calipari brings in a positive way. I do think he didn't screw himself. It kind of just is what it is. He was relying. He was waiting on Oscar Sheboy's decision to come back or not. 
So he was heavily invested in Grant Nelson and uh, in Hunter Dickinson and all these types of players. But because of the balance and uns unsureness of Oscar returning or staying in the draft, uh, I think that kind of negatively affected his ability to bring in a big star through the portal. Um, could he have gone for some more role players or some not so massive stars like those guys? Yeah, and maybe he would have had a bigger chance to get them like he did with Trey Mitchell. Um, but I think it's just kind of the way of the way of the land and it kind of is what it is. Ryan, do you ever hear anything that's more than just scuttlebutt that says he's had enough? The, it's it's a pressure cooker, unlike any college got job in America. Um, you know, having broadcast games at Rupp Arena and been up there any number of times as a spectator, there's a pressure up there that nowhere else has. Do you ever hear that? And do you ever hear him? I'll take an NBA job if it's out there. Yeah, uh, I so the answer to the first question, yes, I hear a lot about everywhere, Kentucky being one of the spots. It's also very tightly kept, everything that's going on. John Calipari has been through these things so many times, right? And he understands everything. He's well aware. He's well spoken. He knows what he can say and can't say. I don't think he's going for an NBA job soon. He's definitely, I know he's been offered an NBA job multiple times, um, but his poise and his maturity and things, I think, uh, shouldn't be taken with a grain of salt. And I don't think he's going to be going anywhere. Okay, last thing on my end before I turn it to Kelly. Oscar Shibway, a year and a half ago, certainly his stock was up here compared to where it is today. Is he simply a bit player in the NBA who can't take his game out far enough? To an extent, yes. Um, I wouldn't put that a cap on him on his game eyes per se. Um, but I think because he is such an unbelievable rebounder on its own, it's going to give him a role in the NBA. And that's why he was able to sign a two-way before summer league even started. A lot of guys that are go undrafted are battling for two ways and they might not even get there. They might be stashed in the G League and bounce around all the time for years to come. Um, but Oscar does a couple of things so well that he's going to be a professional basketball player. He's going to be in and out of the NBA, maybe in the NBA for years, for a while. Um, but I do think he has a pretty clear ceiling on his game for sure because he's a little undersized. And like you said, he wouldn't have come back to school if he, after winning National Player of the Year if his stock was high enough. So, Kelly, say hello to Kyle Hammer. Ryan. How you doing, Ryan? How you yeah, What's right, up? Just, yeah. I just call him Kyle. That's, <laughs> That's all. okay. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan, can you, you hear me? I'm having I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties on my hand. Do you hear me? Oh, yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's stick a little bit closer to home here. Uh, Rick Barnes the last couple of years, really good coach, like him a lot, like what he does. Can you get those guys over the hump, you think? I mean, I know he had a lot of – he had an injury to a star player this year with the, with the point guard. But uh, you think he can get the Tennessee balls over the hump and maybe get them to a Final Four? I think at some point, yes. Um, honestly, when you look at Tennessee and their their past teams, like they've gotten to high season – "Quote unquote underperformed, but on the on paper their roster is not as talented as the other teams um, that they are completely outperforming in the entire regular season and sometimes in the first round of March Madness. The system that he's built there, especially the defensive system in the last two or three years, is unbelievable. We saw San Diego State ride that kind of system to a Final Four this year. We've seen a lot of defensive teams uh, go right on that. Do they need the influx of talent that maybe they don't have again this year? Maybe in the future they need a couple of they need a guy Julian Phillips to stick around." Uh, and not go to the drafting and have that opportunity to completely break out. Uh, or they need a guy like Kennedy Chandler from a couple of years ago to return and be one of the best players in all of college basketball. He could have been and would have been in year two. Um, so I think you need that talent for sure. But the Tennessee Vols, like they're looked at as an underperformer in the tournament, but they have such a good floor of success at this point because of what Rick Barnes has kind of implemented. Um, so will it get there? I think at some point, I don't know if it's this year though. Okay, so let me ask you this, talk, talking about him. He seems like an old-school guy, kind of like when I grew up. He was an older-school guy. That's kind of how I was playing football. Uh, is it hard for this new-age athlete to go to a guy like that? Um, maybe in some ways, like you're saying, a lot of guys, like I talked about Grant Nelson before, just a random example, who he's this lanky, thin, kind of mobile, versatile forward where he might not go to a team like that and play in that kind of system where you had Olivier and Conwell last year really thrive, especially in the tournament, because – he is bigger. He's bulky. He's physical. Uh, we see a lot of the guys like Jonas Adu and a lot of different players like that that are physical and can uh, really le lean into this gritty, like high work rate, uh, high intensity system. So I don't think it's built for everybody, but I do think it's built uh, for the people that it is built for. They get the most out of it for sure. So I think there's a, a balance to yes and no there.
I got you. So, uh, Jerry Stackhouse, um, it seems like he's kind of underperformed since he's been there. Uh, had a lot of guys leave this past year. So, what, what does that say about him? And, I mean, is he kind of on the hot seat? Has he got to win some games this coming up year? Yeah, I honestly thought they were going to get the tournament this year. They made a run at the end of the year, kind of like AM and did last year. Both those teams out of the SEC kind of got screwed uh, by the selection committee and the, how it kind of went for the whole season resume. Um, but it's on the hot seat, I'd say for sure. When you look at a lot of former players, uh, Penny Hardaway is a guy that gets maybe a bad reputation sometimes, um, but a lot of turnover in their rosters. And uh, I think that just speaks to their demands of the roster and their demands of the players. And also now, like we talk about turnover in teams, when things don't go well, guys are just going to leave like that, whether they're trying to get money elsewhere, whether they're trying to just find a new role or just a new home for them that better fits them. Um, guys are going to leave. So, uh, yes, Vanderbilt, I think they had a decent year last year. They're doing better. Um, but it, it's kind of just the lay of the land that it is in the, uh, in the current college basketball landscape. Okay, so let, let's talk about that. With, with all this NIL stuff and the transfer portal, uh, the recruiting deal, uh, good or bad for the game, I mean, I know it's going to stick around. We, we understand that. That's kind of our society now. That's the way things are going. But what are your thoughts? Is it good and bad? And, and then the second part of that question is uh, we talk about it all the time on this, and I talk about it in recruiting, but recruiting in football and, and in basketball, in everything, recruiting has got so cutthroat. And so dog eat dog, it's just it's crazy from when I grew up to what it is now. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, like you said, even from when I grew up, uh, it's it's changed dramatically even in the last five, ten years. Um, but overall, I think everything is good. I think because everything is so new, we talk about the portal NIL, they're different, but they kind of go hand in hand at this point. Uh, everything takes a, like a regulation period, right? So college coaches need to get used to it. Players need to get used to it. Uh, agencies at this point, like NIL agencies, need to get used to it and accustomed to what is actually going to be the standard going forward. Obviously that'll change and ebb and flow over the years, but uh, there has to be some kind of standard where we go on where Miami's not spending $900,000 or whatever it is to go get one player and then another player. Um, overall, I think it's good though for the game, for the sport. Zach Eady wouldn't have come back to school this year. Maybe Oscar Shibwe wouldn't have come back to school last year. And uh, Grant Nelson wouldn't have come back to school this year. So a lot of talent is going to keep returning and be those developed four, three, maybe even five or six year stars in the sport. Uh, so I do think that overall everything that's happening to the game uh, is, is good for it. I got you. So my last question is this. Uh, we all know what happens. Well, what happened to Bob Huggins? And he's had, uh, you know, obviously with that situation that he had a couple of weeks ago, he, he resigned as the coach uh, at West Virginia. Uh, does he get back on somewhere? How does this um, upset what he's done for his whole career? I mean, really good coach. I met him one time. I told George that I met him in an Indianapolis 500. Uh, was around him a little bit, didn't talk to him that much. But how does this – does this tarnish his deal, and does he ever get another job? Yeah, it's tough. Um, I like Bob Hoggins a lot. Like, I know of so many – I know him per relatively personally also. And he um, – people get remembered for bad things sometimes, for one or two bad things. But a lot of good comes from a lot of those kinds of people. And Bob Hoggins is one of those guys where he's done so much for different players and families and people throughout that he's encountered in Morgantown. Uh, and it's sad to see go out like this, especially when – you know, he's kind of at the peak of everything and he's been there for so long, so long tenured. Is he going to get a new job? That's kind of TBD, I think. I think in due time, maybe we saw Chris Beard come back from what happened last year and get a new job at Ole Miss. Um, I know Bob Huggins can be a successful coach. I know he still is that caliber. He's still that same person. Uh, it's a shame what happened. Obviously, it's not it's not really acceptable. But uh, I guess maybe in a year or two, we'll see what happens. It just depends on how things kind of blow over. Got you. Well, I appreciate that, Ryan. Thank you, Brittany. Hey, Ryan, uh, thanks for coming on, man. I got one more here for you. Obviously, yep. we mentioned Jerry Stackhouse. Uh, he had a player by the name of Liam Robbins that down the stretch of the season caught the attention of a lot of NBA scouts. And I thought he was a guy that might end up getting drafted maybe late second round, but he ended up going to New Orleans with the Pelicans. How do you see him fitting in New Orleans? And also, how quick do you think he could he could get, uh, get up and, and play in the league? I mean, do you see it as soon as this year or maybe more of a project? But the other thing is he's got to stay healthy. Yeah, for sure. The health thing, obviously, right away, like you said, it. Like I, I don't need to harp on that at all. Um, but a lot of those college bigs that you look at, we talked about Oscar before, Trey Shax Davis went to 57. Um, uh, who else went down? Colin Caston went undrafted. Adam Sonogo. Like the list goes on, and they can all succeed. Are they all going to be able to succeed at the same time in the NBA? Probably not. Uh, but Liam does have a pretty good skill set. Remember him and Jake Stevens from Chattanooga are two, two bigs that I actually like a lot um, that I think have a really good versatility that could really thrive in summer league. And to be completely honest, after this week, I think I'll have 
a much clearer answer because summer league for guys like that, that are battling for two ways or on two ways and are undrafted free agents or trying to battle for long-term deals and, and jobs really in the NBA right now um, are really going to tell, tell their tale in the here in summer league. So, Hey Ryan, let me, uh, let me run more, one more thing by you. The yeah. uh, commissioner of the big 12 sort of put it out there that, once they lose Texas and Oklahoma, they would like to expand by two. University of Memphis has been down this mating road with the Big 12 about four different times. Is this the time they knock down the door? Maybe because teams from their conference are going. Houston got teams that they've battled with year in, year out, right? Um, obviously, I see things from a basketball lens, but I'm trying to take in every other aspect of it because – People, everyone says, oh, Gonzaga should go to the Big 12. Well, like, yeah, like I think they should for basketball, but it's not that simple because football allocates so much resource and, and money and stuff like that. Um, Memphis is probably one of the teams at the top of the list, I'd have to imagine. Uh, I think it definitely depends on what happens with the Pac-12 also. Hey, before you leave, plug some of the stuff you do. You have some great social media content. I appreciate that. Um, appreciate it. I do my best, but... Every social media now we got threads, whatever, but Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, video stuff, YouTube. You can search my name. I'm sure you'll find it pretty easily, but always doing as much as I can, covering the game on all levels. Uh, and hopefully, I, I, there will be more to come. So come to Nashville and teach me. I need to learn all this stuff. I'm, I'll take you up on that. I'll be in that. I've never been, so I'll be there in a heartbeat. Come on. Wh where, where are you based out of? I'm in New Jersey. So I'm by the, I'm right by the beach. There you go. Nice. Nice. <laughs> go Mets. Oh, yeah, there you go. Mets fan, you, you know you know the vibe, so. Actually, go Braves. Uh, hey, <laughs> thanks. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me on. Ryan Hammer joining us on the show. He knows basketball backwards and forwards. It was fun getting the chance to talk to him, but we will shift gears after the break, get to college football, and one person's opinion of where it's all going in the next, uh, you're talking about Brett McMurphy. Yes, I am. Okay. Well, are you his opinion on what? Well, underdogs. Oh God! Well, I thought that was a fact. This or is well, that just who knows whether it's a fact how much or it'll not? Change. I mean, yeah. How many how many odds can you find on week eight? So some of this yeah. is what he believes. It, yeah, it's but it's cool. Be. It is. But first, let's talk Big Machine Music City Grand Prix. You see the dates at the bottom of the screen. Not far away, less than a month. And I'm excited. I'm going this year. I've never been to a Grand Prix before. Some of you who have heard this commercial know that. A lot of people in this area had never been to one of these two years ago. And yet I hear it consistently that it's one of the coolest events they've ever been a part of. The music speaks for itself. Three days of tremendous tremendous music around this event and now the tickets are on sale you can go to musiccitygp.com you can go as low as general admission all the way up to the highest forms of amenities they have got it all for you it's musiccitygp.com as the trusted premier custom home builder in middle tennessee donnelly timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615 456 7983 or log on to donleytimmons.com. 
For over 35 years, Wilson Bank & Trust has been committed to providing customized banking solutions to help individuals, families, and businesses in Tennessee achieve their goals. As your full-service community bank, we are proud to offer loans with competitive rates, local decision-making, and fast, friendly service from our experienced lenders. No matter where you are on your financial journey, Wilson Bank & Trust is ready to help you take the next step. Visit your nearest Wilson Bank & Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC, Equal House. Housing lender. Family owned and operated for more than two decades, Alaco Finewood Floors is Nashville and Middle Tennessee's choice for premium quality hardwood floors. Since 1995, Jimmy Alaco and his army of employees have embodied the approach of taking pride in one's craft and providing superior customer service, growing from a one man shop to a team of 23 professionals who share the founder's passion for quality craftsmanship and customer satisfaction. If you are interested in contacting them, you can find their headquarters at 2505 Winford Avenue in Berry Hill or give them a call at 615-356-0303. Again, that's 615-356-0303 or log on to alacofinewoodfloors.com. Alaco Fine Wood Floors, serving Middle Tennessee's hardwood flooring needs since 1995. At Baird, we have a different slant on global financial advice. That global capabilities mean nothing without personal attention. We have investor relationships in 35 countries and market expertise in over 40 industry verticals, all to help make the most important investment connections of all, yours. Global financial advice with a client-first approach. It's the shape of things to come. Discover the Baird difference at BairdDifference.com. So I caught this little nugget yesterday. Brett McMurphy is a really good college football reporter, now works for Stadium. Uh, for years was, I guess, ESPN, wasn't he, Billy? Yep, he was with ESPN forever. However, as we have learned, not everybody that's been at ESPN stays at ESPN. <laughs> that's right. It's it's getting kind of crazy. Uh, Can I know you say Disney. David Pollock was let go. Susie uh, Colbert, Steve Levy, Max uh, Kellerman, Jason Jeff Fitz. Van Gundy. Yeah. Well, uh, what they, they did, let Susie, they let, they let Susie Colbert go. They sure did. What they did, Kelly, was they anybody that they were paying a hefty amount to that was doing like one show for each season, like just Monday Night Football. Or, yeah. ju- you know, ju- they weren't doing the bulk, uh, similar to some other people. So they kind of trimmed the fat. But I did see where Pat McAfee is the highest paid person at ESPN now uh, after after Good. they hired Great. him, which is kind of crazy, too. Yeah, How about that? Crazy. Okay, so what we're going to show you is a graphic that will list underdogs throughout the season. We've got a series of graphics. We've got yeah. two more after this. Brett McMurphy believes, and, and some of this, some of the early lines in the opening week of the season are out. He is basically going on best guess info. Stanford, Western Michigan. Congratulations. According to Brett, you will both be underdogs in every game this year. That's a ama- that's amazing, George. That Stanford is an underdog in every year. Stanford, when when Jim Harbaugh was there, he kind of brought that program back, and then he turned it over to David Shaw, and then he had a couple of good years, and then they went downhill from there. They're really bad. Yeah, it's taken a big nosedive. Uh, David I- Shaw kind of screwed him over a little bit. I mean, they they weren't very good his last couple of years, but it's, oh. al- it's almost like he kind of just up and left all of a sudden. Now here's a long list of teams that will be underdogs in 11 of 12, and some of them have been the dregs of college football society. Charlotte, they have really had trouble. When he, Will Healy 
didn't get it done there. That shocked me. FIU under Mike McIntyre, really a tough program that he inherited. UMass, the complete dregs of society. <laughs> ODU, <laughs> ODU, not exactly USC. Nevada has slipped big in the last couple of years. Kent State, I don't know about that one. A year ago, they scored a lot of points. Yeah, sure did. In the MAC. UAB in 11 out of 12. And look at the one at the bottom. Kelly, Virginia Tech. In the ACC? That, that's, that's amazing. To, to what Frank Beamer took them to and the heights that he took them to with the players that he was getting. And it's amazing that they are underdogs in 11 of their 12 games next year, or could be, uh, as we talked about. But the Hokies have just fallen off the map the last couple of years. It's crazy. Why do you think that's the case? I don't know, George's leadership. Uh, you get, you've got to get kids in there. You've got to get them to Blacksburg. You got to, I, I play with a couple of guys from Virginia Tech. They love it. But, you know, Bruce Arians actually played there too. He was there this past year. He got inducted into their Hall of Fame. And, uh, it's obviously a great place to play. He got them to so many heights when uh, when Frank Beaver was the coach there. But it's it's absolutely uh, after the guy from Memphis. So what was his name, George? Uh, Justin Fuente. Fuente. After he went there and just he, he you thought that he was. It's kind of like Will Healy when Will Healy leaves Austin P and goes to Charlotte. You think so much of him. And then when Fuente leaves Memphis and goes to Virginia Tech, you think he's got something. And then I don't know what happens. It, it's like he, he brought Memphis up and he got them to uh, kind of where they are now and they just keep going. And then he goes to Virginia Tech. And I, I don't know what happens with that. Like, did he not, did he not uh, hire the right people? Did he hire all his buddies and not the right guys to run his offense and defense? Or did he? Did he fall short in recruiting? You just you, you never know what goes on in a program and why they why they fall after he did such a good job at Memphis. I'll yeah. say this though: Brent Pry is in the James Franklin coaching tree. I think that if not this year, he's he's pretty soon he'll turn that around. I, I know last year was tough, but Brent Pry is a really good coach. I, I don't know what people think about James Franklin, George, and I, I know you had a lot of probably run-ins with him and uh, and not run-ins, but you talked to him quite a bit when he was at Vanderbilt. But uh, when I got inducted into Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, he was there that night. I've never seen a more personable guy in my life. Whether you like him or you don't like him, he brought a lot of people, he brought a lot of attention to, to Vanderbilt. And, you know, and they always say whether it's good attention or bad attention, it's still attention. And he brought attention to Vanderbilt. And I've never seen a guy that – like a, he, he met everybody in the room. And if that's what Billy's saying about this guy, he's, you know, he's got the personality. If he's got the personality to get it done, uh, he's kind of like Butch Spirit. And if you try to say no or you can't get something done, guys, guys like that, that's a, that's a fire, that's a, that's a fire under their belly and they'll get it, they'll get it turned around. We could have a whole show on James Franklin stories. Well, first of all, James is a born recruiter. Oh, okay, unbelievable. I can tell this story now, but uh, when when he and I first met, the first time we ever met Kelly, we were doing a remote, a radio remote, and it was actually at Belmont. We were in the atrium uh, at, you know, on Belmont's campus. And I told him at the time, I said, be very careful with this job. I said, because it's buried some good coaches. They're not all stupid. And so that night I get a call from James and he goes, I've checked out your credentials. You're legit. Tell me what I need to know. <laughs> and Kelly, he's a born recruiter. As you oh, saw. Unbelievable. Yeah. As you saw that night, the guy was born to be a recruiter. And that's a big chunk of what goes on in college. If you can recruit, you're likely going to do well. Well, and he was a winner, too, at all costs. I mean, there I don't know if there's another coach at Vandy that ever did the things that it took to win, good or bad, you know, To but sometimes, I mean, in the SEC, it's what it takes. Well, I can tell you this, that indoor practice facility, they had no intention of building. Yeah. And he kept pressing and pressing and pressing 
And finally, he got it done. Good for him. Yeah, I've just, I just never seen a guy that night. I, I've never seen a guy. He went up to every single person, whether it was a man or a woman, and he shook everybody's hand and he made sure that they knew who he was and what he did. And uh, when he goes into a when he goes into a parent's home, especially being at Penn State, uh, he seems like a guy that can seal the deal. If a guy's uh, teetering on going somewhere uh, other than Penn State, if he goes into that home, he can definitely sell it. He can sell his program. He can sell himself. And and parents uh, parents like that. They they like somebody like that who's flamboyant. Uh, who can talk, and, man, he can do it, George. He's uh, he's really good at it. Now, check out this list um, of, of underdogs in 10 of the 12 games. This is where it gets a little hairy. Th- this is where it gets very difficult. On the top line there, Cincinnati two years ago was in the college football playoff. This one's kind of ridiculous. This one's a real stretch. Oklahoma State. This has been a traditional 8 to 11 victory team every year. Even under... Rutgers, like Shiano had a good year last year at Rutgers. If I uh, I mean What was his record? I thought he had a decent season. Did he? Yeah. He's got Maybe Vandy wrong, but... on the bottom line. By the way, if you're wondering, that's Vandy's um new logo. logo. Yeah. Which I'm like, uh. <laughs> it's grown on me. Yeah. I, didn't, I wasn't a fan at first, but it's it's grown on me. Tulsa, I'm not surprised about. They're in the middle of the second row. Kelly, to the left of the bottom row is Texas State, which five years ago I thought was a prison. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're wrong, George. That's really bad. You're thinking about uh, you think about all them guys that got off the bus on that movie, Texas State Penitentiary, baby. Young man, you've been sentenced to Texas State. I feel like they're not helping themselves with their logo. I mean, what is that? Oh, I don't know. Bobcat. And it's a Texas State Bobcats? Yeah, but the coloring, I, I mean, that, I don't, yeah, I mean, they could have helped themselves out a lot more. So look, this wasn't overly scientific. And yes, it's a slower time of the year, but we thought it would be interesting to share one person who's a pretty darn good college football reporter. His views on it. Go back to the 10, Billy, for just a minute. Cincinnati, man, that is going out on a limb. Oklahoma State, that is really going out on a limb. We'll see if he's right come September. After the break, stat of the day, and then a moment all of you have awaited, Kelly's World of Mm. Football. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate, James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications, and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615 832-9511 832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Hey, thank you for meeting with me today. The insurance company has made an offer. Already? Wow. They've offered you the entire policy. Thank you, Blair. You're so welcome. This is my buddy and former Nashville Sounds PA announcer, Eric Berner. I always laughed in the old days at Greer Stadium when I would walk in, Eric would immediately play my favorite song, Van Halen's Jump. But then I learned he actually has a real job with Rock Castle Wealth Advisors. Yeah, George, uh, that's what I do. I help people in the pursuit of making their money live as long as they do. Everybody's situation is different, so I use a customized and individualized, personalized approach to the person I'm working with. Uh, Old 401ks, uh, retirement planning, insurance planning, inheritance planning, uh, those are things that people like to get some more information about. One of the things I find is people don't even know where to start, and that's where you come in. Yeah, so I can help usually help people with an initial phone call or uh, meeting that is a no charge and no obligation. And I'll bet you have a phone number and a website. I do, George. 
Uh, they can call me at 615-235-1058 or rockcastlewealth.com or eric at rockcastlewealth.com. Hello, this is Celeste Middleton, a State Farm agent in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I want to help my neighbors and local businesses be proactive and assess their risk before something unexpected happens. We want you to have a thorough understanding of your coverages to have the best protection when you need it. We can create a personal price plan for you. Our team has over 70 years of experience helping people in Middle Tennessee. We have an awesome team with integrity and provide honest and prompt communication. And we love what we do and genuinely care about everyone we work with at our office. Give us a call at 615-895-2700. Send us a message at celestemiddleton.com or walk in at our office at 803 North Thompson Lane in Murfreesboro. We would love to earn your business. Welcome to John English Antique Sports and Cards located at 204 East Depot Street in beautiful downtown Shelbyville, Tennessee. Their phone number is area code 931-492-4304. John, obviously I've been blown away by what I've seen at your place. I've now been there three times. But for the person who's never been, what should they expect? Well, we have a 3,000 square foot store, George. Half of it is vintage cards uh, in all sports. And then half of the store is, a lot of people call it the museum, where there's a lot of uh, early equipment and just the history of sports in general, baseball, football, basketball, golf, tennis, and other items. When somebody comes in there that you know is a big sports fan, what is their normal reaction? Well, I think that they're uh, pleasantly surprised. And of course, being in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which is a very sm a small town that you would never expect a shop like we have to be in. Uh, so they're kind of, I don't want to say blown away, but uh, as I said, pleasantly surprised. It's time for Stat of the Day, brought to you by John English Antique Sports and Cards in Shelbyville, Tennessee. You can find them at 204 East Depot Street. They're open during the week, Tuesday through Friday from noon to 5, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5. Give them a call at 931-492-4304. All right, let's get to Stat of the Day, see what uh, David actually gave this uh, to me as well. Shocker, it's a Braves question. The Atlanta Braves... <laughs> The Atlanta Braves currently lead the major leagues in home runs at 166. The last time the Braves finished as the league leaders in home runs was all the way back in 1973. Can you name the player who led the 1973 Braves in home runs? Uh, Kelly, the three were Hank Aaron, Dave Johnson, yes. and Daryl Evans. I don't think it was Aaron. I think it was either Daryl Evans or future New York Mets manager, Davey Johnson. It's one of the two. Well, my, my only guess was Hank Aaron. So I, I mean, there you go. So it's either Hank Aaron or Davey Johnson. Oh no, 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 no. Hank Aaron. <laughs> it's not Aaron. No. So you're saying Davey. No, it's either Dave, jo Davey Johnson or Daryl Evans. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, George. Yeah. Bye. Look at young Davey. So, Kelly, the uh, old Atlanta Stadium was an absolute home run paradise. It was yeah. probably the easiest park to get a ball out of, and they only had about a, a six-foot fence. And so you could hit those screaming line drives that would get out of there before a left fielder could get back to the fence and, and haul it in. <laughs> it was, it was truly, it had the nickname, the launching pad and it <laughs> truly was. Yeah. Well, that was your wheelhouse. That was a good, uh, that was a good guess. The only one I had was Hank Aaron. Oh, I wasn't about to let that one go. <laughs> no. 
How old are you, George? I mean, why are we why are we allowing David to still do this? David has left. He's not coming back. So why are we allowing Dave, uh, David to keep doing this? Hey, it's taking some work off of me. This is set, finding. I mean, a Billy. Gr- is hey, Billy, easy. Billy, Billy, grow up, man. You start making the stat of the day. David's done. There's the grow yeah. up. There's the daily grow up line. I love it. <laughs> I guess he showed you, didn't he? All right, I'll, I'll have you tomorrow, Great. Kelly. <laughs> okay, thanks. Get something else other than baseball. There's some other sports out there as well. He's sick of all these whoa, baseball whoa, whoa, questions. Whoa, whoa. Hold on a second. Okay, it's baseball season. Yeah, but it's about to be football season. By the way, look at that old Braves uniform. That's beautiful. You know, well, what they've <laughs> done, they've gone, they've taken the home uniform, which was a white top with all that royal blue. And they have turned that into a weekend uniform that they're wearing. Sharp. And they are selling the absolute crap out of it. I kind of like it. Yeah. I like it. They could sell anything in, good looking. in their merch stores well, yeah, right now. When, but... when you're ahead by 30 games. Okay, so <laughs> do we now have Kelly's big moment? Yes, we do. Kelly's moment in the sun. Here we go. It's a moment you have breathlessly awaited. It's time for Kelly Holcomb's World of Football. As shocking as this may sound, Kelly Holcomb's World of Football has sponsors. It's brought to you in part by Baird Financial with Yaz Hassan and Justin Oldham and by State Farm Insurance located in Murfreesboro through agent Celeste Middleton. You know, it seems like it's been years since uh, the whole country was riveted to the DeMar Hamlin story. Um, And there it was at Riverfront. Well, not Riverfront, the the uh, the Bengals, Paul Brown Stadium. Yep. And what was it? It was uh, was it January 2nd? I want to say that's correct. Does that sound right? Maybe that next week, but I. But I know it was early January. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, now it's been almost six months. Not only is it a miracle that DeMar Hamlin is with us, alive, prospering. There he is throwing out a first pitch at Yankee Stadium recently. But, Kelly, he's been cleared to play football. And I've got to believe that privately – if I'm part of that Bills coaching staff, I'm a little nervous about it. You know, I mean, th- this was life and death kind of stuff. I'll be honest with you, George. I'm kind of nervous about it as well. Um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, because uh, it keeps going in and out on me. I'm kind of nervous about it as well. That's why I wanted to talk about it today because – Obviously, he's been around. He's doing uh, he's doing his community service, going around talking about that. They've gotten CPR out there while he was on the field. I mean, he went at, into cardiac arrest, and they had to resuscitate him through CPR. And uh, it it was riveting for the whole country. Uh, it really worried me because I thought, you know, they say he had died. I I, I thought that that was going to be such a bad stain on the National Football League. It's something something that I played for 13 years and uh, am, am really fond of the National Football League. Obviously, it's it's why I'm talking on the on the podcast here because if I, if I wouldn't have played in the National Football League, I wouldn't be here and probably wouldn't know you either, George. So um, I, I don't know. It's just uh, I, I'm, I'm like you with the coaches. Uh, I, I know that the doctors would not allow him back on the field if he hadn't passed every test that they had given him. And I'm sure he had an extensive test and the extensive physical, but I don't know. It's good. It's good for him. But my, my concern too is like him. He, he has not had contact since that night. And is he going to be able to come up and make a tackle as a DB? Uh, that's got to be going through his head. I, I don't care what kind of physical shape he's in now, um, how much he's worked, there's still that piece in your head that the last time I hit somebody, I almost died. And uh, that's just – I don't know if you – I don't know how you get over that, George. I really don't. And maybe he can. But I'm sure Sean McDermott and his coaching staff are thinking the same thing about 
we still got to monitor him. We we know that he's coming back. He's a really good player. We drafted him. Uh, he's helped us get to the point where we're at right now. But uh, we need to watch him and see what happens. Uh, I, I'm sure they feel confident because the doctors have said there's nothing wrong with him. He's good. But is he going to be the same person and the same player that he was before that happened? Because we all know that that is a production business, any professional sports production business, and you've got to be willing to go out there and sacrifice your body. Is he willing to do that? And if he's not, like, what do you do with him if he's not? I, I, I don't know. Like, he's gotten to the point where he's such a fan favorite and what happened to him was such a tragic deal that, that didn't end tragically. It ended great for everybody. It ended great for him. But um, how, how do you come back from that, George? I, I'm just not sure. And if you're the Buffalo Bills, if he doesn't come back as the same player, what do you do? Are you going to cut him? I mean, you're going to be – everybody's going to be on you for that. Do you give him a job? Do you do – I don't know. Uh, it's just – it's up in the air for me. And I'm. it's going to be interesting to see just how this plays out. Okay, let's try – a few of these scenarios. To me, even though this is apples to oranges, it's a little bit like a pitcher who gets hit in the head by a line drive, somehow overcomes it, and then goes back out and pitches. Well, you know the first time that that player goes out there that he's like, oh, my Lord, what if somebody hits one back to me? There's got to be some of that going on with DeMar Hamlin. There's no question some of that's going on. He hasn't hit anybody since that night. Uh, they've had – through all the stuff that he's gone through of getting himself back and getting himself back just able to walk and to do all that stuff, and now everything's fine, uh, they say. But, you know, all through, through all these OTAs and through all these mini camps and stuff like that, you're not, you're not in pads like that. We're not doing that anymore. So uh, until he gets to training camp – you don't really know, but there's got to be some, there's got to be something in his brain that says, man, the last time I was on this field and hit somebody, I had a really bad injury. So it's just going to be interesting to see, can he get over that in his mind? Can he be confident enough to go back out there on that field? And when a running back or a wide receiver or a tight end is coming at him, can he lower his shoulder? Can he lower down to get in that tackling position? Cause you know, he wasn't ready that night when, uh, when T or when, uh, uh, the kid uh, T. Higgins hit it. Yeah. He was not ready to make that contact yet, and that's what happened to him. T. Higgins got into him, and it kind of looked like a it looked like a car crash when he hit him in the chest. His his whole body collapsed over him, and you know that's not how you tackle, obviously. But uh, man, that's got to be in the back of your mind. I can't. I just I don't know. I'm sitting here trying to put myself in those same shoes. And I really don't know if I could do it. Because, George, I remember the last play of my professional career. I was playing the Philadelphia Eagles, and that was the team that I was with three months earlier. Uh, they had traded for me uh, during training camp or before training camp. And uh, I went there, and then I played against those guys. And two of the defensive ends met me in the backfield. I don't know what my, my offensive tackles were doing, but it wasn't blocking very good. And they picked me up, and they slammed me, and they dropped me. It was the first time in my career that I got – drop right on the top of my head and I felt a sensation it was like fire going from the top of my neck all the way down to my toxic bone my butt bone and when I went out when I went out it scared me and I jumped up I'm glad I was able to jump up but uh, when I got on the sideline I told them you know they knew what happened and I was really scared but then after everything kind of settled down in my mind I kind of felt like that probably was my last play I'll ever play. I, I did not want to feel that way, but that crossed my mind, and it turned out that was the last play that I ever played. Kelly, here's a piece of this story that we're probably never going to know. The truth of it is the Bills coaches have got to be on eggshells because they don't know how far to push. You know, DeMar Hamlin's probably saying to them, Work me just like you work every other player. But it's not that easy. Sean McDermott and his staff have got to be walking through eggshells about this. My guess is that what has happened, and I don't know this, my guess is that McDermott, 
The Bills general manager, DeMar Hamlin, and the agent have met. And they have sort of put together their own kind of timetable to this. We are not going to start you out full bore. We need to see certain things. We're nervous about this, whether you are or not. Now, let's say there comes a point in time where all parties know in their heart it ain't there. Can't make it. Not going to be an NFL player. If they have any public relations sense at all, they will jump in the bills and put him in their community relations department because no question. the amount of good that this young man has done before we ever even knew who he was is staggering. Then when it happened, what did they raise? What was it, like $9 million? Something crazy, crazy. like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I would assume that deep down he knows – this isn't 100% certain. This is, this is, this is going to be some trial and error. And there may be a point where he almost has to go to them and say, I'm not sure I want to do this. There has to be open lines of communication because there's a coaching staff on eggshells. There's a player who may say he isn't, but you know to some level he probably is. There's a family on eggshells, probably an agent on eggshells, and everybody's like, boy, I don't know. And that's really what we're, that's what we're dealing with. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, I don't know if Sean McDermott and them are on eggshells, but I, I'm sure they're probably apprehensive about putting him out there. I'm sure you – I think you're that's, – that's a good explanation as to probably what did happen. I'm sure they've all – all parties have sat down and they've discussed this and they've talked about this. Uh, I'm sure they're wondering, just like I'm wondering, just like you're wondering what's going to happen when he finally does hit somebody. I think that's the true test. Can he get back to the player that he was and can he get back to being physical and physical like you need in the national football league? Can he do that? But if that doesn't happen, uh, I don't think – I think he's a – I truly think that he's going to be a bill for life because I, I don't think that if he – if he does not make this team this year, if you're another team, are you giving him a chance, George? You're not going to take that. You're not going to take that chance. The only chance he's got is with the Buffalo Bills. And then if he gets back with the Buffalo Bills and he plays and everything's okay and he plays for two or three years, then all this is behind him. We can forget about that. But – if he does not play and he can't come back to the form that he was at, he doesn't have the confidence to go out there and to play like he did or to be able to come and tackle somebody like that, I think it's a no-brainer that he's a Bills he's a Bills guy for life. They're going to hire him, and they'll keep him on staff as long as he wants to be there. I really believe him. Here's another gut feeling. Again, I have no proof of this. Right. I'm guessing that there's already an agreement in place that he will open the season on injured reserve. That they're going to take this really slow. He could. I mean, that, that could be a deal. Uh, uh, that could be where they're going to take him so slow. They're maybe going to give him one rep a day and then maybe increase it to two reps a day. Maybe get him in one tackling drill and see if he can tackle somebody one time. After that, I I'm not sure, George. I really, I'm really, I'm uncertain about it just like you are. It's going to be interesting to see. It's kind of a tricky situation. I know they've weighed everything in and out, but I don't know. We'll see. The other side of this, I think, is if he does get back on the field this season, how do the other teams react to him, right? How does a receiver. That's a really good point. If he's getting ready to come across the middle against DeMar Hamlin, does receiver lay off? I mean, that. It's the NFL, probably not. Kelly's shaking his head. But th I think that's mm. another aspect. How do the other teams – but then again, Kelly, you know it. There's not there's not a single darn NFL coach or player that would lay off if DeMar Hamlin's – I mean, that's the NFL. But again, I think you got to kind of think about that. No, but I think there are players who don't necessarily want to be put in that position. Yes, yeah. That's, that's a good point, George. They don't want to be put in that position, but I don't think it really matters. If he's out there on the football field and he's playing and he's starting, 
I mean, all bets are off. I mean, they're going to try. They, it doesn't matter. They're trying to right, yeah. George, one more note. I know we got to go to the break here in just a few minutes. To add on to Kelly's world of football, I don't know if you know this yet, Kelly, but Jamison Holcomb's Troy Trojans are hosting James Madison this year, uh, September the 16th. That game will be broadcast on the NFL Network. Really? Nice. Yeah. Just Did report, not know that. Just reported by Brett McMurphy, uh, Army and ULM on September 2nd on the NFL Network. I guess it's some sort of college special. And yeah. then Troy, I don't know if you're going to that. You probably bet you are. But uh, well, I'll be there. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you weren't, it, it's going to be on the NFL Network. So we'll, we'll, we'll be tuning in. Yeah. To heck with the kid. You're staying home. Watch it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know he'll appreciate that. Okay, after the break, we'll be joined by former Predator goaltender Chris Mason, even by my own standards. That was really tacky. I got it. <laughs> Chris Mason, hopefully, will get me out of this mess. When we come back, stay tuned. Hey, thank you for meeting with me today. The insurance company has made an offer. Already? Wow. They've offered you the entire policy. Thank you, Blair. You're so welcome. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate, James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615-832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Year number two of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night was awesome. And the reason is really simple. I chose Strike and Spare, and they were amazing. They have great food, great bowling, and a staff that is truly ready to go the extra mile to help you. They have five family fun centers in the area to choose from. And for more info, go to strikeandspare.com or call them at 615 615- Eight two four five six eight five. Now that the weather has gotten considerably warmer, there's not a better place to spend a morning or an afternoon than Riverside Golf Lanes. So you've probably noticed the weather has gotten a lot warmer, and that means a couple of things in Nashville. It means baseball, and it really means golf. And for me, it's a visit to Riverside Golf Links. The course has improved dramatically. There are now 27 holes, including a nine-hole executive course. If you want tee times or more information, dial them up at 615 615- 847-5074. You can't see the sights without the sounds. From the crack of the bat to the roar of the crowd and everything in between. Discover what Hit City has to offer. Single game tickets are on sale now. Hello, this is Celeste Middleton, a State Farm agent in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I want to help my neighbors and local businesses be proactive and assess their risk before something unexpected happens. We want you to have a thorough understanding of your coverages to have the best protection when you need it. We can create a personal price plan for you. Our team has over 70 years of experience helping people in Middle Tennessee. We have an awesome team with integrity and provide honest and prompt communication, and we love what we do and genuinely care about everyone we work with at our office. Give us a call at 615 695-2700. Send us a message at CelesteMiddleton.com or walk in at our office at 803 North Thompson Lane in Murfreesboro. We would love to earn your business.
Well, earlier today, this Ford Ice Center in Bellevue was hopping. The uh, Predators had their future stars game, if you will, with a lot of the young prospects, some of whom got drafted a week ago. And uh, Willie and Chris Mason did the game for a stream, uh, did it on a Predator stream. And uh, Chris joins us by phone. Chris, first of all, thanks for taking the time to do this. Yeah, of course. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. That was, uh, it, was fun, uh, it was fun seeing you and, and watching hockey again in the middle of the summer. Amen. So tell me, when you see a game like this, what are you looking for? I'm just looking for, um, you know, obviously their, their draft picks. You had Wood and Molendyke out there, their first rounders. Just kind of what these guys bring to the table. There's obviously a lot of, you know, different age groups, different experience levels. A lot of these kids, you know, some play, uh, you know, in Europe, some play college, some play junior, some played in the American League, some have played NHL games. So just to just to see kind of how they they compete and and just what different players uh, bring to the table, how they use their skill sets. Uh, do they make other players around them better? Maybe you know, looking at a couple of guys and, and kind of projecting, you know, what kind of player they could be and maybe their potential, but um, just for the guys to go out and showcase. And that's as a player, that's exactly what you're trying to do. You're playing in front of, you know, Barry Trotz is there, everybody, the whole brass, um, all the scouts, all the coaches. Uh, so it's kind of a, you know, it's a big stage here for a lot of these kids that just got drafted. So let me start with Matthew Wood. He's a big kid at six, four, and I gather that's part of what intrigued the Predators was getting a little more size. He was he was great. I, I thought he was the best player out there. Um, you know, obviously the scouting report was that he's got a great shot, great hands, good hockey IQ. Needs to uh, work on his skating. He was the youngest player uh, in the NCAA hockey, you know, playing against uh, some 24, 25-year-olds. Uh, he had a great year. And... Uh, you know, I, I thought it was evident uh, that skill set in the scouting report and, and why they kind of targeted him. You know, when you look at somebody that's really successful, that's kind of uh, been in the same mold, Tage Thompson, it took him a while to, you know, kind of get to that elite status, but he had that, you know, type of playmaking ability, that, that, that great shot, um, that hockey IQ, and he just had to work on his, uh, you know, becoming a stronger skater. And it's not like, you know, it's not like Matthew Wood is a bad skater or anything, but to get to the next level and to be successful, um, you know, in the NHL, he's definitely going to have to work on that. But I, I thought he showed very well. Uh, and Molendyke was the other draft pick that we mentioned. I thought though they were the two, you know, most impactful players out there. And they were obviously both their, their first round picks. This year, Molendyke's a smaller guy. I thought he, every time he got the puck, he's looking up ice, making plays, but, you know, moving the puck up to his, his teammates and then joining the rush. And um, and I thought he, he played well defensively, blocked a lot of shots and kind of got his nose dirty. So he has that element to, to his game as well. Chris, are they two years away? Is that realistic? What is realistic? Every player, I, I you know, I, I think for Wood, um, you, you have to see. I know they'll probably – you know, go back to their respective clubs this season, um, you know, and play this year. And then uh, development at this age, it's so hard to predict and project, you know, 18-year-old kids, 17-year-old kids uh, to one, two years away because I think there's a, a lot of growing um, that needs to be done uh, off the ice. And I think, you know, Nashville typically doesn't hurry guys. They like to go through Milwaukee you know, let them experience um, the pro level there, really get an opportunity to play right away. Whereas, you know, if these guys come and, um, you know, try to crack the Predators roster, uh, it, it's tough unless you're, you know, a top one or two picks. Never say never, but that's typically been the way that the Predators have done it. They want the guys to develop. They want them to learn culture. They want good habits. Um, when you get to, you know, the pro level, the defensive details and the defensive side of things are, um, you know, that much more important and detailed. Um, so you don't want to put a, you know, a young kid in a situation where, you know, maybe he could play and maybe his, his skill level is good enough, but, you know, you don't want him playing, uh, you know, for, for Matthew Wood on a, you know, a fourth line or third line ball or something like that. Um, you know, maybe he play on the power play, maybe not. You want him to go down and, you know, play on the power play, be the guy, play in all situations. Same thing with Molendyke. So 
Um, you know, depending on the development, a, a two year for, for wood could be, uh, you know, a possibility, but I, I wouldn't count. I would look at about a three or four kind of year arrival for him, but you never know. I mean, he's a young, young kid playing some against some uh, really good competition and having good success. And, you know, from what I saw today, uh, he definitely has the tools to, to be an impact player in the National Hockey League. Chris, you played for Barry Trotz. A lot of us uh, were here when, you know, this team got here. I think, you know, he and I laugh. That was the first interview he ever did in 97 when he got named. Uh, it is becoming very obvious to me that Barry Trotz is going to be a very good general manager and has figured out where all the bones are buried in this franchise. He, uh, he has, and I think, you know, he's had the benefit, I think, of stepping back from the game, um, kind of, you know, he had the good opportunity. I know he had a ton of coaching offers, and uh, different things like that, and he really assessed what he wanted to do, obviously takes care of his family first, and then once, you know, you're out for a while, you miss the game, and I think he's really been preparing for this, uh, you know, for longer, you know, than we've known. And when somebody like Barry who wants to come in and do just an awesome job and to accept this job, he wants to be ready for it. He's going to put his stamp on this organization. Um, he's always done that. He was, uh, you know, uh, an out of the norm kind of coach back in the day when it was kind of a lot of you know, hard nose, uh, old school type of coaches. He really had a different approach where, um, you know, he, he was very relatable. He got players, he got the best out of players because they, they just loved the way that, you know, he showed them that, that he cared for, for them as people, not just, you know, commodities uh, or, or assets or whatever, just that disconnect. And uh, I feel for the general manager job, he's had some really good influences. Obviously, David Coyle, Lou Lamorello, I think are very, um, you know, they're probably the longest serving general managers in the, in the National Hockey League. And he had the opportunity to work with both, um, which both guys have had a lot of success over the years. So he loves to learn and he also is a very uh, strong individual. So you're going to have a, a unique uh, new wave general manager and one that no stone will be unturned. Barry's a tireless worker. So I, I think you're right there class is he's gonna he's gonna do it his own way he's off to a really good start hey kelly before you ask uh, chris mason a question did you notice the film footage i did notice the film footage yeah, yeah that's called plaster vision was that was that you yes it was and you'll notice a pole go ahead and show it again uh billy you'll notice about midway through that <laughs> while it looks pretty good right here what we're showing looks like i know what i'm doing and then all of a sudden, the damn pole got in the way. <laughs> that that created a little problem. I had to work around that. Anyway, Kelly, say hello to Chris Mason. Chris, how you doing, man? Good, Kelly. How, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Can you hear me okay? I'm having a little technical difficulty, so I want to make sure you can hear me. Yep, loud and clear, buddy. Okay, sounds good. Um uh, Everybody wants to give grades. NFL wants to give grades. Uh, NHL wants to give grades. What do you give Barry Trotz for his first uh, first draft? Well, I, I think, and he'll he'll do that as well. But I guess at the end of the, the day, he makes the decision. Uh, I feel a lot of that, and a lot of this was transition was both, um, you know, David Poyle, Barry Trotz, but Barry Trotz coming in, Poyle's handed over the reins. It's obviously official now, but I, I really feel that good leaders surround themselves with good people and you trust the people that are hired to do the job for you. The scouting staff led by Jeff Kelty, the amateur scout, uh, uh, Tommy Nolan. Um, I, I feel like Trotsy in, when he was a coach, he hired the people that he could trust to do certain jobs. And I think right now, um, their, their scouting staff, I talked to all the guys today, they're extremely happy with their draft. They got the guys they wanted. There was a few that um, got picked right before they were going to pick. Uh, they did everything they could to try to move up when, when the case, uh, when the opportunity presented itself, obviously that's always not going to work out. They were able to do that in the second round, I believe, and got uh, Nielsen, who's a nice young Swedish player playing in the, in the uh, you know, the men's league over there, but uh, they did well. And, and I, and Trotsy as well, just, the way that he kind of gives those guys the freedom. He's like, Hey, you know what? I want to take big swings here. I want to go for the guys that have, you know, big potential. Maybe they're not 
you know, perfect right now. And there's some rough edges, you know, Matthew Wood maybe is one of those guys, um, but has potential to be great. And, uh, you know, Molendijk's an, another player that, you know, he looked great out there, but, you know, he can get better. There's more offensive upside to his game. And that's the job of a scout. And it, it's, it's really tough. It's probably the hardest job is to identify uh, talent and then project what it's going to be. Can it be an NHL player? How much better can this kid get? You know, wh- where do we go from there? But um, I give him, I give him good grades because, and for the, the July 1st, for that matter, the free agents they brought in, uh, one of the biggest things that Barry Trotz has always preached as a coach and now he's doing as a general manager is culture, you know, playing the right way, being a good teammate, being a good person. You know, it's great if you're a good hockey player, but he's always wanted, you want good people on that team. You've got a lot of young players that are going to be a big part of this team for the next decade. And you need good leaders. You need good mentors to come in and show them the way because it, it's, it's grueling. There's a lot of pressure. It's great when it's going great, but you need those strong, uh, role models for when things aren't going so good to, to help these young players kind of get out of that and understand the situation and just, you know, just guide them through and help them through and just kind of show them, you know, what it's like to be a winning pro. Got you. So uh, let, let's expand on that. Who was the, uh, cause, cause they did sign some free agents. They re-signed some guys, but who's your biggest free agent they signed or is it just a collective group? Well, I think it's a collective group because I, I feel they all offer, you know, very similar attri- attributes. I think Ryan O'Reilly won a Stanley Cup. He's one of the best uh, face-off guys in the history of the game. Um, he, he's, he, he can put up points offensively, but he, he's one of the grittiest, hardest working guys uh, defensively too. He, he penalty kills and he's just, he's just relentless and fearless. And if you ask anybody that's played with him or that knows him, uh, you know, all they have is, is, is great things to say and they rave about his character. Luke Shen is one, you know, he, he's tough as nails. He's a good teammate. I played with him in a world championships, Hal Gil knows him. It's, and it's the same thing. If you ask anybody about Luke Shen, that's all they say. What, what a great guy, what a great teammate. Um, you know, he's going to stick up for the, these guys. He's going to take a lot of that. Guys won't be running at Roman Yossi uh, as much when Luke Shen's out there. I can promise you that. And then, uh, you know, same with uh, Gus Nyquist hard worker, just, you know, kind of that relentless, awesome teammate will do anything to win. And I think when you, you have these people in your locker room, you know, it, it sets a certain standard. So as a young player, when you're looking at the leaders on the team and they play to that level of intensity and they, that work ethic, you know, in practice, the way they conduct themselves off the ice, that's the standard. You have no choice but to live up and to play up to that. So I, I feel that all three of those guys really check that box and are, are big personalities, you know, leaders, good leaders follow, you know, leaders as well. And I think there's a lot of the leadership core here is a, is a great leadership core, but you, you have more guys, I think, to follow. And for, you know, some of our guys too, to, to be around guys that have won Stanley cups. Got you. So with coach Brunette coming in, obviously he's, he's an offensive guy, but how, how different will, this coming year's team look from the, from the team that we had last year? Well, I, I think right now, I mean, on paper, I, I think the team's better than they were at the end of the year. Um, I think to the end of the year, I think they overachieved a little bit. Um, a lot of good young players had a lot of great production, you know, more than was expected. But I think, uh, you know, at the end of the season, you kind of sneak up on teams. They look at the, our roster and, you know, Forsbergers, or we had half of our, you know, star players out of the lineup and you kind of get overlooked. I, I think it's going to be a real challenge for the young players that had success at the end of the season. Tommy Novak, Luke Evangelista. Uh, I mean, you go up and down the list. Yusuf Barsanen is a, a really good young player. I think he's going to be uh, an impact player for this team for many years, but uh, you're not going to sneak up on anybody anymore. So it, the league gets harder. Once they know who you are, once they know what you do, it becomes a lot harder. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested to see. And again, that's why you bring those leaders in to help get, to guide these young kids through some of those uh, growing pains. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, the back end is great. If, if And again, this is barring health. And obviously, every time you have a star goaltender, UC Saros, one of the best goaltenders in the world, I think you've always got a chance. But I think as of now, on paper, this team is uh, is a lot better than they were at the end of last season. Yeah, and this is kind of like a comment from me. George and I have talked about this, and uh, when I was playing for the Buffalo Bills, I went to a couple of Sabres games, got into a little bit of hockey, got to get into it more. I remember when the Predators went 
everybody was watching it to the Stanley Cup. But uh, it just seems to me, and you can kind of allude to this, but it seems to me with all the young guys coming in for some of the older guys that got hurt last year, but the young guys coming in, and then you've got all these signees. It seems like there's a lot of good stuff going on with the Nashville Predators and what Barry Trucks have done so far. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you always have to, I guess, uh, you know, hold yourself back because if you look around the league, they're in a really tough division. The Western Conference is really tough. And it's hard to know, you know, what to expect from some of those young guys that had great finishes to the season because really they're getting called up. They've got nothing to lose. So every, you know, they're not expected to win. There's not that pressure on them. They're just going out there and playing and having fun, which, and I love that. It's just, and as you know, it's hard to continue that as you go in your career because you you realize what's at stake and the pressure's different and all that kind of stuff once you're expected to win. Um, but but it, it does feel good. And I think not just for necessarily next season, but just, you know, moving forward as an organization and where, the, the uh, I guess, uh, decisions and transactions that the organizations made, the people that are in place. I think Barry was just an awesome hire at the end of last season. He's going to do a great job. And, you know, it's exciting. you got a, a new wave uh, coach who is uh, an original Nashville Predator. He's going to come in. And he wants to play an exciting brand of hockey, too. And you got all these young kids and veterans and, uh, you know, kind of a fresh, like, I don't know, just invigorating feel to, around yeah. the team right now. really is, man. It really is. Well, I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Hey, Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot yes. before you leave. Is this a playoff contender? I, well, this is a team that I believe could make the playoffs. I, I don't know. You know, I think they're going to be right on that, uh, on the bubble, you know, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 kind of a team. But uh, I would not count these guys out to make playoffs. So I, I definitely think that's within within reason. Um, you know, and Barry Trott said it himself. He said, I didn't sign these veterans to come here and, you know, end their careers and retire here. He said, I brought these guys in to win. So you're going to, you're going to have a group of guys that expect to make the playoffs. So I, I, and I think, you know, if barring health, I think if this team can stay healthy or relatively healthy, I think they've got a shot for sure. Chris, really good of you to take the time to come on with us. Thank you as always. Thank you guys. Have a great day. He and Willie do a great job. Chris Mason is the uh, Predators television color analyst, and he is really good. Uh, he knows his stuff, and you can tell that when you watch one of their telecasts. Kelly, I know my stuff as well, and nothing proves it more than plaster bed of the day. Oh, gosh, here we go. He must have won yesterday. I didn't even keep up with it yesterday. You've got to step oh, it up a notch, though, here, George. You, you've got when, – when's the three or four bet day coming? Baseball party. Oh, it'll tomorrow. be tomorrow. Tomorrow? tomorrow? It'll yeah, be tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. It's not yeah. going to matter. I'm going to have some damn – so damn many wins, it's not going to matter. <laughs> Put yourself in so danger. Full of garbage, dude. Put your neck out there. We will uh, give you tonight's victory when we come back, so stay with us. <laughs> As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee – Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. You can't see the sights without the sounds. From the crack of the bat to the roar of the crowd and everything in between, discover what Hit City has to offer. Single game tickets are on sale now. Family owned and operated for more than two decades, 
Alaco Finewood Floors is Nashville and Middle Tennessee's choice for premium quality hardwood floors. Since 1995, Jimmy Alaco and his army of employees have embodied the approach of taking pride in one's craft and providing superior customer service, growing from a one-man shop to a team of 23 professionals who share the founder's passion for quality craftsmanship and customer satisfaction. If you are interested in contacting them, you can find their headquarters at 2505 Winford Avenue in Berry Hill or give them a call at 615-356-0303. Again, that's 615-356-0303 or log on to alacofinewoodfloors.com. Alaco Finewood Floors, serving Middle Tennessee's hardwood flooring needs since 1995. At Baird, we have a different slant on global financial advice. The global capabilities mean nothing without personal attention. We have investor relationships in 35 countries and market expertise in over 40 industry verticals, all to help make the most important investment connections of all, yours. Global financial advice with a client-first approach. It's the shape of things to come. Discover the Baird difference at BairdDifference.com. Hey, thank you for meeting with me today. The insurance company has made an offer. Already? Wow. They've offered you the entire policy. Thank you, Blair. You're so welcome. segment on a thursday it's almost the weekend and uh it's almost college football legends night time as well we're getting closer and closer to uh to that fun event sunday night right before sec media days next sunday crazy that it's already coming up so we'll get to some information about that but first bart durham injury law best in the business give them a call 615-242-9000 again 615-242-9000 or look them up on the web at bartdurham.com. It's time for Plaster's Bet of the Day. You want to do you want to do that first, George? Yeah, I'm I'm basically going to take the Texas Rangers tonight at Fenway. And there's one simple reason for that. Nathan Avaldi, former Red Sox pitcher, a real battler going back to Fenway. This is going to be a very emotional night for him. He throws about 100 I'm a big Nathan Avaldi fan. I think the Rangers get it done tonight at Fenway. Why? Why did you not show my gaudy record? I think we've we've seen enough of that. No, I think we need to put that up there. I mean that that's an order. Nothing gaudy about it. That's a hell of a record right there. Look, it could have been something like eighty and one hundred and forty. Let's not act like you've been going on a limb here. What do you mean? I mean, these have been, it's not like these have been, oh, cra- good, crazy bet there, George. You know, I mean, it's when a lot you, of. When you start doing run lines, it's not like I just took the Dodgers last night. It was Dodgers minus a run and a half. That's a much different story in baseball betting. We'll see. By the way, I fell asleep. <laughs> The Dodgers have got a bunch of starting pitchers hurt. Dustin May Mm -hmm. out. Walker Bueller, the former Vandy pitcher, been out out, out for a good while. Clayton Kershaw on the disabled list. If the Dodgers don't get these starting pitchers back, they're not all that good. Now, when they're healthy, they're as good as anybody. They're the one the Braves should fear the most. But when they have all these starting pitchers hurt, and they're basically going with triple-A starting rotation, right now they are very gettable. Yeah. Pittsburgh almost got them for two out of three. Dodgers, it'll be interesting to see what they are able to do. I mean, it feels like they always get to the playoffs, and it's like, uh-oh, from their fan base. Now, let's get to the uh, to the big college football legends night. Kelly, this is going to draw the largest crowd we've had in the sports speaker series, we already have right at 125 signups already. 
And so if somebody's watching this and they're saying, yeah, I'll call later next week. I don't know because that's a lot of people. And, you know, I don't want to have to turn anybody away. If you want to get in here comfortably. Do it now. Yeah. It's simple. Kelly's in. Kelly is in. I, to my shock, he is in. Kelly Holcomb will be there. Yeah, you can get his autograph. She. So that means I've got to come to the Ford Ice Center two times next week because we're meeting Thursday. Is that yes. correct, George? Yes, we are. Yes. And then I'm gonna have to come for a Sunday night if I can get there. Don't act Should like. There. Don't act like you know you're being put out. <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you some of my garnishment, I'm, Kelly. I mean, I. I, I, I <laughs> I just can't. I mean, I say this over and over, and I'm sure people are tired of hearing me say this, but it's amazing that, George, you got that lineup. That's just amazing to me. It is pretty cool. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. And they're they're probably pumped, too, because they haven't been able to get together, I'm sure, in a while. I mean, David and Philip, I don't know. But I mean, I'm sure these four know each other well. And yep. they haven't probably gotten together in a while. So that, yeah. that's another cool part. Tony Barnhart's got a brand new book we're going to plug that night. Anyway, mm -hmm. if you want to make a reservation, simply email me at plastergeorge at gmail.com. Again, that's plastergeorge at gmail.com. Let me know how many people are going to be in your party. We'll get the seats reserved for you. And off we go into the wild blue yonder. Kelly, have a good weekend. I know you won't be back tomorrow, uh, but we will see you on Monday. And hopefully we can get uh, – hopefully Billy can, you know, with his technical difficulties, can get my mic working. Yeah, stay on with me here, Kelly. We'll figure this out. Well, because every time every time Billy comes on and I hear his phone, it sounds like a 747 taking off in my house. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want oh, that. We don't that's need that. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's your fault. This was a perfect. It is his fault. This was a perfect Kelly, example. Whose of, fault is it? It's Billy's fault. Okay, George. Whose fault is it? It's Billy's fault. <laughs> Billy's fault. It's at my house in Murfreesboro, but it's Billy's fault. We'll blame him for something else tomorrow. Stick around, check us out, and see where we go. See you.